So, yeah, thank you for giving me the chance to present my data here. And um, this project I did together with Laura in the lab, and we were really interested in figuring out how ribosomes are stored in the egg. So early development, um, transcription is not active. So all initial processes depend on post-transcriptional level of gene regulation. And also genesis does not take place during the first hours develop of development because of the absence of transcription. So initial all translation depends on maternally deposited ribosomes. And in an fish egg, there are trillions of ribosomes present. And this is an enormous number compared to millions that are present uh, normal cell. But besides this large number, what was which in other organisms, the translation is repressed at early stage development and was shown on one side at the level of mRNAs, which are yet not optimized for translation, or at the factors, which certain ones are only expressed at later stages or differentially modified. Um, stuck. Certain. Um, so one thing we want to know when we started this project, if all patients repressed at early stages of superfish development. And we therefore use polysome gradients to, oh, sorry, I'm completely stuck. Um, translation is related at different, um, so on one side at mRNAs of translation factors, but we were wondering also the core machinery, the ribosome itself, so we therefore want this is also the case in seaprefish, and we therefore use polysome gradients. So we took total embryo and put them on polysome gradients to assess the state of translation. And I'm here showing you a polysome gradient from one day old seaprefish embryos. This looks like you've seen polysome gradients before. Monosome peak followed by consecutive polysome peaks. Now look at the polysome gradient from superfish egg, and this looks completely different. We only get one monosome peak. Only three hours of fertilization, we do see the polysome peaks appearing. We also quantify this at different developmental stages by analyzing the polysome to monosome ratio. And what I hopefully appreciate is this is really a this over time. So it's also trying to repress it in stages of superfish development. So how are these monosomes stored in a And we use two techniques. On one side, we did mass spectrometry and combined it with cryon. We isolated ribosomes from one hour and six hour superfish ribosomes. And what we found here is a set of facts that are highly abundant at one hour superfish ribosomes, which are three core translation facts, EF2, EIF5A, and EIF5A2. Happy before that and that one B, we termed novel factor. The interaction with the ribosome wasn't shown before. So before I show you our cryom data results from one hour superfish ribosomes, I quickly want to orient you to the ribosome. So monosome is, contains a small subunit, which interacts with the mRNA and the large subunit. At the A side, an amino acid with a charge with a tRNA enters the ribosome. At the P side, peptide formation takes place. The newly formed peptide chain exits the ribosome through the peptide exit tunnel, and the uncharged tRNA exits the ribosome from the E side. What we now observe with cryo, first only going to show you a scheme, is that we could see densities for all these factors we previously identified with mass pack shear all functional important sides of this one hour egg ribosome. On the left, the movie of the Laura build for the one hour cell perfect egg ribosome. So given of these proteins shield all functional important sites, we then term these ribosomes dormant egg ribosome because they cannot be translated active. And what is even more exciting is when we looked at Xenopus eggs, we found the same, uh, the same set of factors bound in the same positions. And now for the talk, to tell you more what we figured out about the function of these proteins on the dormant egg ribosome. The first set of factors I want to focus on is called EEF2B and HPB4. EF2 is a general core translation factor which normally only transiently interacts with the ribosome. But now that we have HPB4 position as normally 
mRNA in an actively tr um, translating ribosome, EEF2 is stably bound to those ribosomes. And this feature has been already described in other systems as a feature in inactive ribosomes. And while HPP4 shown to interact with ribosomes, its homologs and paralogs called STEM1 in yeast and CERPP1 in rabbit and human have been shown to bind translation in inactive ribosomes. Interestingly, STEM1 in yeast was described as a ribosome preservation factor. So up preservation, STEM1 stabilizes ribosomes and prevents the degradation. So if we thought maybe HPP4 has a similar function in the cipherfish egg. We therefore generate HPP4 knockouts and to before knockout cipherfish are viable and fertile. But Karina in the lab noticed when she isolated total RNA from HPP um, early embryos that there are about 30% less total RNA effects. And given that the majority of RNA within a cell is ribosomal RNA, we wanted to know why it affects also the amount of ribosomes. So we therefore did polysome gradients, and what we observed is that while it has no effect on the amount of polysomes, we do see at one hour reduction in the monosomes. We also quantify this, and then in the amount of monosomes, we see about 30% reduction. It was completely surprising and mind-blowing to us that these embryos are happily developing with 30% less ribosomes. On one side, it tells us that happy before might be important to stabilize monosomes in the egg, but secondly, these, even though ribosomes might be still sufficient to completely cover under standard lab conditions the translation needs of these embryos. The second set of factors that we found bound to the dormant egg ribosomes is called DAP and DAP1B. Interacting with a core translation factor called EIF5A, which is again stably bound. DAP and DAP1B associated protein and DAP associated protein 1B. Those are paralogs and they're present in all vertebrates. And they interact on the ribosome in the same position as the nascent peptide chain and tRNA. And if we look close directly into the peptidyl transferase center, where normally the P side tRNA would interact with the terminus of the newly formed peptide chain, then the C terminus of DAP1B, and especially this one clue in here, takes the same position as the C terminus of the nascent peptide chain, but expands further down. The peptidyl transferase. Given the location of this protein and occupying this functionally input inside before it might act as a translation inhibitor, we therefore generated double knockout superfish B. And again, we did not observe any morphological defects in the embryos, they were fertile, but we looked at the state of translation by using polysome gradients. And there we observed the effect. There we saw that utilization we already seen slight increase in the amount of and if we quantified it then we do see that there is an increase in the polysome to monosome and if we compare it to our time course that i showed you in the beginning then this looks more similar to a two to three hour while which would argue that 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 one we really might act as translation inhibitors translation dynamics change that dramatically during early hours of superfish development, we decided to use an in vitro assay to really so whether those two proteins act as translation inhibitors. So you used rabbit reticulocyte lysates at increasing concentrations of DAP and DAP1B protein and assessed translation of a vanilla mRNA by luminescence. And what I'm showing you here that with increasing concentrations of protein, we do see in relative luminescence for DAP1B and BAC7, which is a microbial peptide known to inhibit translation. While to our surprise, DAP1 did not inhibit translation in this assay. And we were really puzzled by it because in vivo we do see both proteins bound to our superfish ribosomes. And then we looked at uh, the sequences of these proteins. So I have to mention here that in most organisms, DAP1B is actually called DAP-like 1. And these proteins share two highly conserved motifs, one at the N-terminus and the second one at the C-terminus, which is inserted into the peptidyl transferase center. One thing that all proteins share is this 100% conserved glutamine, which we found to interact with EIF5A. 
And the second thing that we notice is like one proteins have an additional amino acid at the C terminus. Now we wanted to know if, first of all, deglutamine is essential for DAP, DAP1B function. And we mutated deglutamine to alanine or aspartate, and we saw that this completely abolishes the ability of DAP1B or DAP like to ribosomes. Secondly, if we now take this last amino acid here, which extends the protein further down into the peptidyl transferase center and make mutants where DAP contains an additional amino acid and DAP1 one, one less, we might reverse the function of these proteins. And this was not the case. So now we don't know where this difference in functionality in our in vitro assay for these pro proteins, where it comes from. And we want to further investigate in the future. But given now that we see that DAP1B is able to inhibit translation in vitro, we wondered whether it's sufficient to induce the egg ribosome state also in rabbit reticulocyte lysates. So we added recombinant and then purified ribosomes from these lysates. And we were really still really surprised by these results. But what we could show with MassPEG and CryoM is can reconstitute the dormant egg ribosome state also in rabbit reticulum lysates because we found when we add up one B, all other um, proteins get also recruited to it. That our lysates don't contain HPP4, but we could recruit its paralog SERPP1, which is present in rabbit reticulocyte lysates. And given other data that I don't have the time to show you today, we actually think about those um, four factors organized being in two modules. Module one comprises of EEF2 and SERPP1 or HEPP4, which is important to stabilize monosomes. While the second module, DAP1B and EIF5A, is important to repress translation. Now we wondered if modules act on the same set of dormant egg ribosomes together in vivo. And to further understand this, I generated triple knockout superfish, meaning DAP, DAP1B, HPP4, triple knockouts. And first of all, we wanted to assess the state of polysome gradients. And we again observed the reduction of monosomes. And when we quantified it and compared it to other mutants, to our surprise, this reduction was than in a HPP4 single knockout. And this was also the moment we really observed the phenotype. And from triple knockouts, we saw that we get more quality eggs, but also when we looked at the eggs and embryos that we obtained from um, triple Y knockout crosses, we saw that when we assessed successful early embryonic development, six hours post fertilization, we see about a 30% reduction. And when we do reciprocal crosses, crossing wild type male to a triple knockout female and the other round, we could show that this is an egg specific effect. The embryos that look normal at six hours post fertilization, we then further assessed. And I'm going to show you here in a videos of wild type and triple knockout embryos 12 hours post fertilization, because what we did, we observed an overall developmental delay. We then, the start of um, the York tail extension to quantify um, the developmental delay. And when we did that, show that triple knockout um, superfish embryo a bit more than one hour delayed compared to wild types. I have to mention here that of those embryos that develop relatively normally except for this delay at one hour, we also then see at following stages a reduced survival. And with that, I come to my summary slide. What you today is that we discovered this novel dormant egg ribosome state where we know it's also conserved in Xenopus which contain three proteins which were in the ribosome interacting before and two core translation factors. Where HPP is important to stabilize monosomes in the egg and dap dap one b translation inhibitors during these early stages of development. What we don't yet know is on one side, the hierarchy of assembling the state and releasing it we don't know how these factors upon which signal they are released. And furthermore, how these ribosome, core ribosome controlling mechanism feeds into the system of trans, um, translation regulation during early embryogenesis. And 
with that, I want to thank you for your attention, Andy, for being so excited and involved in this project, and everyone who participated, and especially David Hasselbach, who helped us with the whole crime, and everyone else um, involved. And yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Great, thank you, Frida. Uh, so if you have questions, you can use the Q&A. So just okay. type in your question and then I'll moderate it. You know, maybe maybe I'll start. You know, I, I'm still surprised how mild these phenotypes are. No? Uh, I mean, yeah, what, 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 what do you think is going on here? Um, you mean in the triple knockout or in the... Knockout. Even in the even in the triple, it's still relatively still doing pretty well, no? Yes, but I think it's because we have free inhibiting proteins, and we have so many additional layers of translation regulation, which could easily compensate. And I think under conditions, we keep the relatively happy. But I think as soon as there's a bit of stress, no matter at which stage of development, then it fails. So I think we're really at this edge, what is still possible in terms of, I think every additional or missing factor would then really lead to a strong phenotype. Yeah. So James Briscoe has a follow-up question on this. Um, is the developmental delay seen in the triple mutants cumulative? So is it the overall rate of development is, you know, lower? Or is it the result of a checkpoint at some specific stage where you kind of dramatically arrest? I think it's cute. So, mm -hmm. and I honestly had also a hard time to pin it down because it also is super clutch dependent when I see that something goes wrong. So I have from 0% fertilization right up to um, the whole dish is dead at three days. I see everything. So... I mean, total, but it's super variable at which point they really fail. And I think they're just general super sensitive due to this 50% reduction in ribosomes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So Alex Cornian asks, why do you think these three regulators evolved in parallel? And then also, did you try to stress the single mutants? Um, I think that... It's completely speculative, but given the transcription is absent during early embryogenesis, most regulation depends either on degradation of proteins or translation of new proteins. And by having so many parallel mechanisms, it really allows to really precisely regulate translation. On the other side, we all of these crazy numbers or these crazy high numbers of maternally deposited ribosomes, if all of them will ever become translationally active. Because we also think about these large number of ribosomes that they might be a perfectly packaged source of nutrients, nucleotides, and amino acids. So maybe to kind of preserve some of these ribosomes, there's also so many additional layers of translation inhibition and stabilization necessary to really control how many ribosomes are active at which time point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, last question. Oh, oh, sorry, did you want to add something? No. No. Oh, the stress, the stress of the of the single mutants. We tried a bit, but we did not further look into it. Yeah. A final question is: Do you think a similar dormant-like state might occur at other developmental stages? Honestly, we thought about it, and especially we thought about diapause, for example, in killifish, which is not superfish um, related, but I cannot. That this might also happen during starvation or yeah so far we only looked at the x this is something we clearly want to look at in the future okay great thank you so much frida that was great <laughs> beautiful beautiful paper